a, a short program, but where, as you know, we have a featured speaker that is highly respected, not just in the United States, but globally, Michael Chertoff, who has, is the founder and chairman of Chertoff Group, and as you all know, very distinguished uh, Secretary of Homeland Security. Also someone who I think all of us understand is one of the, one of the deepest thinkers and works as hard. As someone said earlier, Mike, uh, they don't know anyone who works harder on staying up with and, and staying ahead of the issues. So Mike's going to talk to us for a short, just a short, not a long speech, but to make some remarks. And then he's going to open up to, uh, to Q&A. So there can be a discussion, and we'll do that for a short period, and then we'll resume with the dinner. So Michael Chertoff, please. Michael. <clears throat> John, thank you very much for introducing me. And um, I know I'm all that stands between you and what looks to be a, a delicious dinner. Um, so far, I think this has been a terrific conference. And I want to thank uh, John and, and Ross and everybody at the Institute for um, really addressing what I think is a, a, a huge issue, a huge economic issue, a huge security issue, and a huge global issue. Uh, and to do it in a place like India, which is very much cutting edge in terms of technology and engineering and IT, I think is exactly the right message at the right time in the right place. So I thought what I would do is talk a little bit about um, kind of big picture and where I see the cybersecurity uh, issue going. And, you know, just sometimes if you step back and you consider the significance of what has gone on in the, in the last 10 years, it's a little bit breathtaking. I'm not prone to believe uh, that every new invention or every new innovation is a game changer. It's all too easy to hype things and to um, exaggerate the significance of things. But I have to say that um, what has occurred in the internet and in the world of cyber really is a game changer on the order of what we saw uh, in the Industrial Revolution. First of all, it is the most globalizing force I think we've seen in the last century. Uh, it is now the case, I was talking to some, some young folks uh, a couple of days ago, that people really can have global friendships with people that they never met. And they can have real person-to-person -person contact and discussion with somebody on the other side of the world. So that the view that people have in the United States and in India is no longer one that's confined to your village or your town or your city or even your country, but it is truly an international view. Uh, you know, just by way of, of kind of dramatizing this, <clears throat> I had the occasion to be in Cambodia last week. And Cambodia is still a very poor country uh, with a, a, a relatively uh, uh, primitive infrastructure particularly if you get out into the countryside where people are still, you know, literally using tools that would have been, you know, 100 years old. And yet you see uh, people walking around with iPhones. And it is remarkable that that technology has penetrated and they have a, a quite a sophisticated and well-functioning telecommunication system. And it is existing side by side with farming as you would have had, uh, you know, in the last century. So that tells you what, it, what an impact it's had. Beyond even the, the international globalizing element, think about the companies that have grown up around purely internet-related business in the last 10 years. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, Apple, Facebook, Google, think of the market capitalization of these companies. And they could not have existed a generation ago. And these are now the cutting edge companies uh, in the United States in terms of, of their economic driving force, their technology, their innovation, and, and their market capitalization. Another profound change that the internet has brought us, think of the number of transactions that now take place over the internet. You know, we're, we're suffering in the United States right now with this terrible storm. Obviously, our, our thoughts and prayers go to those who are suffering and, and afflicted now by this storm. And one of the consequences is that people are having to recalibrate their flight schedules. And everybody's doing it online. And they're changing their tickets. They're transacting business. Uh, all of this is now done electronically and wirelessly. And we can do it from another part of the globe. So more and more of our economic activity is taking place in cyberspace. 
And it's not only information and data that's being moved, it is literally the operation of control systems. Uh, we're talking about having a smart grid in, this, in the United States and probably in other parts of the world. What the smart grid will do is it will literally operate <clears throat> your heating and cooling based on wireless transmissions that are controlled, again, over the internet. And that's a profound change from the days when everything was done manually. So whether it's social interaction, whether it is uh, transacting economic activity, and whether it is actually controlling the things which take us where we go, heat our homes, cool our homes, and operate our various kinds of critical infrastructure, all of this is increasingly dependent on the internet. All right, what's the bad news? Here's the bad news. The bad news is when the internet was formed, it was formed at a time that it was assumed that those who uh, conducted activities could be trusted. It began, obviously, as a <clears throat> way of connecting different databases and different computers among scientists. And when you think about what the internet is, it really is nothing more than a set of transaction protocols that allows you to take things that are connected mechanically or physically or wirelessly and route data and information from one point to another. Um, and in the old days, it was assumed everybody was benign. So the architecture that was developed was one that accepted trust. What we have now learned over the last 10 or 20 years is that you cannot assume trust. Um, that is why we are dealing with a persistent problem of criminality, uh, theft of intellectual property, and even efforts to sabotage or damage our infrastructure using the internet. There's a, a cartoon that appeared many years ago in the New Yorker magazine that showed two dogs sitting in front of what then was a personal computer screen. And one dog says to the other dog, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And if you think about it, that tells you something. On the internet, you don't know who to trust. All the tools we have developed as human beings that tell us whether we can trust, not just listening to what people say, but the tone of their voice, the way they look, the way they dress, how they gesture, their body language, you know, th things that, that genetics and in the environment equipped us with over centuries so we can judge who we can rely upon and who we should be careful about. None of those tools work on the internet. The internet is a very one-dimensional way of communicating. And so the lack of trust has become a fundamental problem even as the internet grows in significance. And then the second problem is how do we control the data on the internet? How do we control our own data? We put enormous quantities of information on the internet and we don't even know we're doing it. It's a common place to observe that on Facebook and other social media and Twitter, people are now putting more personal information out there for the world than was the case 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. But what is less observed and equally significant is the amount of data we put out without knowing we're doing it. Metadata, information about the device we're on, where we're located, how we're transmitting, where our car is going. All of this data is being accumulated in cyberspace, whether it is, is cookies that are implanted on your device when you do a search, whether it's what your a GPS in your car transmits back uh, uh, through various kinds of, of interfaces, or whether it's the metadata uh, that emerges when you search for particular uh, pages on a website. All of this is out there. And increasingly, and particularly because not every custodian is being careful about how they manage that information, it is possible to go around and vacuum up this information and integrate it and get a very detailed and robust picture of what people are doing on the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, progress of their lives. This loss of control over information has profound implications for our privacy and even for our security. And on top of that, more and more, because we are allowing our systems to be controlled through cyberspace, we even run the risk that we will not be able to control our systems. They did a study about a year ago of automotive systems, which are increasingly computerized, and determined that through some, some automobiles using systems that actually remotely connect um, 
like OnStar, some automobiles could actually be remotely controlled. Someone could hack into a system and, and actually uh, interfere with your ability to drive your car. Increasingly, aircraft are controlled using computers and IT, and whether that can be remotely affected is an issue of some concern. So as we put more and more on the internet, these vulnerabilities and these risks assume greater significance. What are some of the consequences we face? Well, I'm not going to dwell on them, but I'll just speak very briefly about some of the things that have occurred and, and have been publicly reported in the last couple of years. Obviously, crime. Uh, uh, criminals increasingly look to the internet as ways of attacking us, stealing our money, stealing our identity, uh, enriching themselves at our expense. In 2009, we brought a case down against a fellow named Albert Gonzalez, who ran a ring of cyber thieves that stole 130 million credit and debit card numbers, which they used to enrich themselves. Uh, there's a story that um, in 2010, hackers stole $12 million from five banks. And in 2011, hackers stole personal identifiable information from Sony PlayStation. 80 million users had information stolen. It ultimately cost the company over $150 million. That's just the crime. Privacy. We now have hacktivists, uh, groups like Anonymous and Lulzec, and they will hack into your system and they will steal your emails. The purpose of doing this is to embarrass you. Now, we heard this morning that in India, there's, I think, a, a, a fascinating program to get unique identifiers for every member of the population of the country, including a biometric. There's an enormous potential for doing good in collecting that information, in terms of giving people benefits, in terms of making sure people don't impersonate others. But that data also is a tempting target for thieves and criminals and for those who would invade privacy. Third issue we're facing, the increasing prevalence of theft of intellectual property. Uh, over and over again, we read stories about <clears throat> business plans that are stolen, sophisticated technology that is, is taken and creates a competitive disadvantage for those who engage in research and development. Uh, in India, the National Security Advisor reported recently that there was hacking into government networks, espionage. In November 2011, the Norway National Security Agency identified 10 major defense and energy companies that had been hacked and had confidential data stolen. Uh, so over and over again, we're seeing this issue. And finally, and most disturbingly, is the use of cyber attacks to interfere with the operational control of our critical infrastructure. <clears throat> the U.S. Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, gave a speech in the last month that talked about a recent intrusion <clears throat> into Saudi Aramco's industrial control systems. 30,000 computers were damaged or destroyed by a virus called the Shamroom virus, virus that, that infected those computers. And this is a major piece of Saudi critical infrastructure. That virus was then turned on the, a natural gas facility in Qatar. As Secretary Panetta explained, on a regular basis, U.S. chemical, electric, and water plants and transportation facilities <clears throat> are being attacked by malware. And the purpose of doing this seems to be to create vulnerabilities in these important critical infrastructure systems. So we are now in a situation where we've built an enormous uh, part of our economy on the backbone of the internet. A good deal of our operations exist through the internet, and yet because the basic architecture was not built with security in mind, we have increased vulnerabilities and potentially serious consequences. And that's why this summit is very, very valuable. The reality is it's a global problem, and it requires a global solution. You know, I, we, I had the opportunity to some extent when I was Secretary of Homeland Security to work with Indian security officials. That work has continued and increased uh, in the, under the current administration, and it's the kind of cooperation that's very, very important. For example, I know the U.S. CERT and the Indian CERT uh, have formed an agreement. I know there's been some joint work on an international cyber war game, 
and I know that the Indian National Security Council has issued a paper on public-private partnership in cybersecurity, as we've done in the United States. This kind of work is very important, and it's exactly what this summit needs to achieve. <clears throat> but I also want to be candid about the challenges here. Um, I'm not going to tell you that reaching global agreements on cybersecurity will be easy. There are two fundamental obstacles we face. One is the problem of attribution. How do we know who's actually carrying out cyber attacks? Uh, it is very easy for a state sponsor of a cyber attack to deny their involvement and to say, oh, it's just criminals, oh, it's just activists. Sometimes we may know that that's not true, but our ability to prove that or our willingness to disclose it would compromise important intelligence uh, uh, sources and methods, and therefore we can't engage on that level. And the problem of attribution means it's going to be very difficult to create agreements that we can rely upon and trust. So that's one challenge. A second challenge is the problem of what constitutes a cyber attack. I've been talking about things that are content neutral in the sense that they're attacks that either steal money or uh, steal intellectual property or affect control systems. But I know there are some parts of the world where people view a cyber attack <clears throat> as an idea they don't like and who view cybersecurity as an invitation to censorship. And speaking as an American, and I think this is true for India as well, free speech is part of our f culture and part of the fabric of our political life. And because there's going to be, there are going to be some differences uh, in how we view the scope of cybersecurity, we will have challenges in making sure that moving to cybersecurity does not become an invitation to thought control. So I, I think those are two challenges we're going to have to confront if we're to reach agreements. With that being said, though, I still think there are some areas we can fruitfully reach uh, some kind of consensus on. First, I do think that synchronizing the basic rules and operating processes of cyberspace and cybersecurity so that we can have interoperability and, and communication all around the globe is something that is achievable and very worthwhile in doing. I think cooperating on fighting crime in the internet is one where we can achieve an, an international consensus. I don't think any nation state, with the possible exception of North Korea, is really interested in promoting criminal activity. So there's an area where increased enforcement, exchange of evidence, uh, and the ability to extradite will give us a real opportunity to make some progress on a serious problem. I think, as we talked about it at our breakthrough group, uh, dealing with the challenge of multi-jurisdictional legal regimes that govern things like cloud data and other uh, forms of global communication will be very important if we're going to allow the internet to achieve some of its promise. So we don't have conflicting legal regimes. There are differing views of privacy. There are differing views of, of um, how we want the internet to operate. But we should be able to reach some consensus that will allow all of us to enjoy a secure and efficient global network. And finally, even in the area of conflict, I know that the Institute has worked on the question, I know Karl Rauscher's led a group with the Russians, um, on whether the Geneva Conventions and similar rules can be applied to cyber warfare. Um, you know, we cannot say that cyber warfare will not come. There's maybe a debate about what it is, but we certainly have seen in the past uh, the use of cyber tools as an adjunct to military action. So we need to confront the question, are there rules in cyberspace? as there are in physical space? And how do we define them, and how do we begin to uh, reach agreement on them? Again, it'll be difficult because attribution is a challenge. But I think if we start to build this kind of international effort in those areas where we can achieve consensus, first of all, we'll do some good. And second, we may build a framework that will allow the kind of trust that can enable us to take this kind of security uh, internationally to the next level. So thank you very much. Thanks for um, hosting this program. I want to thank our, our Indian hosts uh, and all who are participating. And I'm happy if you can postpone eating for a few minutes to take a few minutes of questions. I think there are mics circulating around. 
I think you have to raise your hand and if you just identify yourself. Okay, sure. Uh, I'm Alok Chaturvedi from Purdue University. Uh, the question for you is, you, you had mentioned things about uh, cyber espionage and stuff like that. So how do you deal with that in, in an international forum? As, as you may know, that uh, uh, about a month or two months ago, there was, for the first time, uh, a whole bunch of uh, AutoCAD files were transferred to a certain part of the world. And these were, you know, this was a sleepy, obscure Chilean town, uh, mining town. So these were all design data which were, which were transferred. So how do you deal with these type of situations where there is a deliberate activity taking place to steal some very critical information? Well, I'm, I, you know, I would say probably of all the areas I have identified, that will probably be the most difficult to reach international agreement on. Um, I don't think it's <clears throat> going to startle anybody if I suggest that there are some countries which either explicitly or tacitly encourage the theft of intellectual property, um, either because it's got a national security benefit or because it's got an economic benefit. And it's highly unlikely that those countries are going to enter into enforceable agreements to prevent that from happening any more than we stopped espionage during the Cold War. Now, you can discuss whether you can create a legal architecture so that when it turns out that a pharmaceutical appears on the market that's produced in a country which hasn't done any research and happens to be an exact copy of what you know has been created in a country that did the research, whether there's some kind of legal recourse there. But candidly, that's probably the hardest area in which to reach an agreement. My argument is we shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, that may be an area we have to deal with on a national level and by increasing our security and our counterintelligence capability. But it doesn't mean we can't deal with criminals and criminality because that's an area where we have a convergence of interest. I hope in the long run um, every country will recognize that a world in which intellectual property is not protected hurts everybody. Because all countries, I think, aspire ultimately to be originators of intellectual property and not merely consumers of it. And, you know, you kind of live by the sword, die by the sword. Thank you, sir. You were very clear in what you said about uh, attribution being a major issue <coughs> in uh, cyber war. But then again, uh, non-state actors are a fairly uh, familiar feature of uh, shall we say, real-world uh, threats that uh, security faces. So when you consider something like this where there is deniability as a non-state actor initiated threat, how would you shape your response to it? Well, I think that, you know, th again, this is one of the real challenges in this area because sophisticated non-state actors, terrorist groups, in many cases can do a, a kind of damage in cyberspace that is almost at the level of the most sophisticated state actor. And of course, they're not going to be party to agreements. And that raises a whole set of, of issues, again, an area where I do think we can do some work in terms of what the rules of engagement are in cyberspace. For example, can you, if you can identify the server from which an attack is being launched, can you disable that server? Uh, what if the server was merely hijacked by somebody, you know, remotely uh, several servers away? Does that matter? Does it matter if the server is connected to a hospital and you're going to take down the hospital system? So, you know, these are all issues which need to be fleshed out because any country can be uh, the object or the target of non-state actors. Again, this is an area where I do think you have some possibility for engagement and agreement. Yes. Thank you. I'm based at the Harvard Kennedy School. And uh, my question to you would be, uh, we talk about collaboration, but what would be your comment or thought on if I make a statement, if offense is the best defense, combined with the fact that especially US government has declared cyber as a domain like <coughs> land, sea, and air, that might be giving signals to international community that offense is the best defense and there might be a difference between 
theory and practice. Please comment. Well, I, I, first of all, I don't think the U.S., uh, by indicating that we have a um, cyber as a domain of conflict, I don't think that was a revelation to anybody. In, in, in 2008, uh, when Russia invaded Georgia, that invasion was accompanied by a cyber attack. So you would have to be ignorant not to see the potential. There's open source information put out by a, a report issued by the U.S. Uh, there's a U.S. Congressionally Chartered Commission on China Security that identifies a number of published papers by military officials in China that talk about domain warfare and cyberspace. So I don't think uh, that everyone was, you know, sitting kind of uh, under a mushroom, as we say, not thinking about this until the U.S. Uh, created Cyber Command. Uh, what I do think we need to do is acknowledge that cyber warfare is a possibility, that it has occurred in the past, it may well occur in the future, and we need to have a doctrine, and we need to have a set of rules about how it's conducted, because ignoring it and pretending it's not gonna happen is not gonna make it go away. It's gonna create instability and the potential for collateral damage that will be much worse than if we actually begin the discussion as we have here at the East-West Institute. Hello, um, I'm interested on the on the part of uh, cybersecurity, uh, but from a very different aspect. Uh, we we live in a global economy. Um, in the year 2008, 85 Americans died from using heparin that was contaminated. Um, Baxter International had a subsidiary done that product in China, and the quality was not very good. In the year 2004, half of the vaccines for the flu uh, had to be thrown away. They were produced in England, and I'm talking about 46 million uh, of, of these. Um, I wonder why is it that uh, DHS and others have not worked an enterprise architecture so that we can use IT, the cyberspace, to secure and prevent, rather than worry so much about attacks, but prevent uh, from the foods that are gonna be imported from anywhere and everywhere, uh, instead of uh, working separately, country by country, when, when this is really a problem of uh, the whole community. Well, I mean, I, I, can t I can't speak about the global issue. I can tell you that um, actually there is, DHS did, has worked and does have the capability working with other parts of the U.S. government to track food contaminants with remarkable speed. I remember when I was in, in, the, in, the, in office, there were some contaminated tomatoes, and it, it was quite remarkable how quickly it was possible to trace the source of the contamination. So it is no doubt uh, uh, an opportunity to use IT and tracking as a way to quickly respond to outbreaks of contamination. IT, however, is not a, it's not a panacea. If somebody produces a product that is contaminated or substandard um, because it's cheaper, IT is not gonna discover that. Um, that's a, a broader set of discussions about how do you maintain standards of quality in a global world where increasingly the things we eat and wear and, and, and use are made in, in varying different places. But IT is an enabler that can allow you to track things and trace them. It is not, however, a substitute for quality control in other areas. I guess we have time for one more if there's one more. Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Pranoti Surve. I'm from RBS, the Royal Bank of Scotland. Just quickly wanted to ask you, Michael, as somebody who's seen the advent of, uh, you know, the whole sc scale and scope of security moving from, uh, you know, international security to, you know, homeland security as well, I'd like you to reflect for us on, uh, you know, how you feel about cybersecurity being considered as a domain, uh, you know, as, as a thing of the future to becoming something that's very much a reality, uh, you know, now with 
3D printing becoming a reality, yeah. you know, concepts like that, things that we considered were somewhere in the distant future, you know, 2050 suddenly becoming 2012. Uh, and, and, you know, also as well, you know, what would you perceive are the, are the real challenges in making effective uh, public-private partnerships, despite the fact that we're now acknowledging this as a separate domain and, you know, we'd really like for the action to happen, but obviously, you know, a lot of efforts being made in the right direction, but no, no sort of uh, effective, tangible, sustainable partnerships emerging from that. So if you could please comment for us. Sure. Um, I guess a couple of things. First of all, when you get to 3D printing, I have to admit, I, that kind of boggles my mind. Um, and I understand the technology is moving forward very rapidly. Um, but on the question of, of how do we address this issue, what are the challenges in addressing it, particularly a public-private partnership, I would just say two quick things. One is, one of the things I've, I've increasingly become convinced of is that a big challenge in getting people to address this issue at a senior level in government and in the private sector is that it is overly mystified that people who are technical <coughs> use a lot of jargon and they use a lot of technical discussion. And that means people who are not uh, engineers tend to think to themselves too hard, I'm gonna let the chief technology officer deal with this issue. And yet fundamentally, what you need to address in order to have cybersecurity are not technical questions, but profound questions of governance, policy, regulation because these set the architecture within which the technology has to operate. And we need to demystify this. We need to be able to make it clear in English that you cannot delegate this issue to a technical person or an engineer. It's got to engage senior leadership in every enterprise. On the public-private side, you know, we, we, in, in, the, um, in recent times, uh, you know, last couple of centuries, we evolved in the nation state to a, a kind of an, a principle that the government had the monopoly on the use of force and security. And while, you know, people can have certain rights to defend themselves, the general expectation was, if we're being attacked by criminals or by another country, our government will take the responsibility for dealing with it, and we're not supposed to take the law into our own hands, uh, except Ross in Texas, where it's a different rule. Um, the reality is so much of what goes on now uh, involves assets in private hands that that model may no longer be correct, that we may need to make it clear that unless you want the government to completely dominate the internet, which would be bad for any number of reasons, uh, the private sector will have to engage and step up with the help of the government in protecting its own assets. But that is a fundamental shift. It's kind of going back to you know, in the early days of the, of the U.S., of the United States, there was a militia, you had militias, state militias. And every able-bodied, in those days, male, was supposed to be willing to pick up arms and defend the state. And maybe we need to have a cyber militia, a concept that people need to be able to defend their quadrant or their part of the Internet because we all depend on it. So. Part of it, just as the internet has changed our concepts of globalization and our concepts of how we transact business and our concepts of how we deal with each other socially, maybe it needs to change our concept of whether we look to the government as having the, the sole responsibility for defending ourselves. All of this makes this a fertile and interesting area for discussion globally, uh, as well as in each of our countries. I know it's been a very stimulating and long and, and, and uh, challenging day. I know we're gonna have another day tomorrow, uh, but it's been great to be here. And, and uh, again, I wanna thank the Institute and our hosts for putting on what has thus far been a very stimulating and energizing conference. Thank you very much, enjoy dinner.